In this very special webinar edition of the TWIP podcast, it's a frank discussion about photographers and the coronavirus. This is TWIP. Thank you, everyone, who is joining us for this webinar. This was, uh, you know, uh, I've always practiced the whole idea of do what you can with what you have. And uh, what I have is a little platform that I can talk to a lot of people, generally photographers on. So I figured um, the issues and the stress that I'm going through right now, you know, with this whole COVID and coronavirus thing is all the disinformation and, you know, all the craziness that's happening right now. So I wanted to get some people on that are in my community, Amy Brooks and Stephen Scharf in particular, that have more knowledge than I have on this. Stephen's a molecular biologist and a bunch <laughs> of other things. Uh, in his bio, if you if you dig deeper on Stephen Scharf, you'll find the words Nobel Prize in there. He was associated with that, you know, a bunch of stuff. So way, way beyond my level of just reading the news and watching YouTube. And Amy works in a hospital, right? She's a hospital administrator yeah. and is on the front lines dealing with people that are that are both helping to combat this thing and also mm -hmm. people that are dealing with it, you know, from an mm -hmm. infection standpoint. So yeah. bringing those two guys together are kind of two halves of a whole. So bringing them together on a webinar with an open chat with a format that we're gonna talk through a bunch of pertinent issues and then open it up to Q&A at the end, I think will go a long way towards demystifying a lot of the misinformation that's been floating around out there. So yeah, absolutely. that is the purpose of this. So looking in the webinar room, I see a ton of people in here. Everybody can hear, people are saying that the, okay, yeah, you're most, you guys are coming in muted. So yeah, just unmute yourself and you'll be able to, or unmute the audio, you should be able to hear it. Um, sound off in the, uh, the chat and let us know where you're from. So, uh, Hey, I see some familiar names in there. Hey, Thomas Aaron. Yeah. Hey, you know, Renee Lisa Robbins, Hey, Michael Rhino, Renee Robbins in here. <laughs> good, 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 good. Diane Hayes. Hey, Hey, uh, Brian Fisher, Brian, how are you feeling? <laughs> so Brian, Brian is a respiratory nurse in Atascadero, California. So wow. hello wow. to him. Yeah. Um, and lots of people. OK, good, good, good. Everybody can hear. Everybody can see. So let's get started because we have a lot of information to go through and very little time to do it. I want to keep this to just about an hour because I know you guys want to get back to your shelter in place routines and uh, <laughs> not be dealing with this webinar stuff. So uh, let's start with some quick introductions. I've, I've got this written down so I don't mess it up. Uh, Amy Brooks has uh, worked for the past 15 years in hospital administration in Providence St. Vincent Medical Center in Portland, Oregon. Amy earned her undergraduate degree at Lewis and Clark College and earned two master's degrees, A type personality, at <laughs> Portland State <laughs> University in geography and Warner Pacific College organizational leadership. And then also on the webinar, Stephen Scharf. Stephen has a broad scientific background in molecular diagnostics, human molecular genetics, cardiovascular genetics, molecular genetics of cancer, HLL, HLA DNA forensics, and PCR. And he has extensive wow. industrial experience in molecular biological product development. I just want to go on the record to say, Stephen, <laughs> I feel accomplished just having been able to read your bio. <laughs> So, geez, man, come on. <laughs> so, I think all of that suffices to say you guys are, are qualified to talk about the topics that we have on deck today. And to make sure that you guys were qualified, uh, people that are watching, we um, we did a dress rehearsal yesterday just to sort of make sure that we're we're concise and we're giving giving out relevant, actionable, pertinent information to you guys. Uh, yeah. So uh, just a quick housekeeping reminder. Uh, as you heard in the bios and you know, I'm a, I'm a podcaster photographer, so I just know how to talk and take pictures. <laughs> so <laughs> these guys have knowledge beyond what I have, but yeah, it suffices to say none of us are physicians. So this is not medical advice, though Amy does work in a hospital, you know, administration. She's not a doctor, Steve's not a doctor, I'm not a doctor. So no. we're not gonna be giving out any sort of recommendations or medical advice or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so with that, let's dive in. We're, we're five minutes in. I'm keeping it on schedule. That was my five minute <laughs> intro. I want to turn it over to Stephen Scharf first. Stephen, uh, you know, go for it. Tell us, give us your prognosis or your, 
your assessment of the situation and the spread of the COVID-19, also known as coronavirus, you know, uh, issue that we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Stephen, you're muted. We can't hear you. Hello. We just heard you a minute ago, Stephen. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, he's getting sorted here. We got Diane Griffin in here, Dennis Dunbar. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, Hello. Can you hear me now, Frederick? Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. I had to turn up the volume there. So sorry, hey. guys. Yeah, All go right. for it. All right. So uh, I'll just kind of um, uh, say thank you for Frederick to put this together. I think that this is, you know, uh, being a scientist, you know, my motivation every day when I went to work was to try to make some sort of contribution to society, however small. And I think that this webinar helps to do that as well in kind of these anxious times that we're dealing with with Mm -hmm. um, this pandemic uh, worldwide. And I'll just kind of preface that, that, you know, I've been doing a lot of the, I I won't go into the details of the molecular biology here, but I've been reading a lot of the scientific literature, the published scientific literature on this. And I I just want to, you know, kind of let people know that they should be um, really thinking about this in an informed way. And, and the first thing to understand is it's, this is not a, um, a, an outbreak to be, to be considered lightly. This is a very dangerous virus. Uh, it's more contagious and pathogenic than the SARS uh, virus that gave the world a big scare back in 2003 timeframe. Uh, I won't go into details, but this virus is both more contagious and has higher lethality. So um, it infects more people. So if someone's infected uh, and they come into contact with other people, uh, on average, two to three people can become infected um, from contact. And the reason for that is is that is that the um, incubation period for this particular SARS coronavirus is about five to six days, which means people can be infected um, and not sick yet. And uh, they can be coming in contact with their family members or friends or the people that they work with and not know that they're actually infected because they're not showing symptoms and be spreading the virus to other people. And I think that may be in large part due to why we've seen such very rapid growth in the United States uh, over the last two weeks or so. Uh, So it's very dangerous from that perspective. So people should really be careful uh, about that. And I'm going to talk about, again, the importance of social distancing and and self-isolation from that perspective in just a moment. Um, the other thing is, is this virus is more pathogenic. That is, it will make people sicker than the regular flu by anywhere from 10 mm-hmm. to 20 times. So again, um, when people get really sick with this, particularly folks that are older, um, you have to be really, really careful. Um, and to add to that, one of my notes here is, is that if you happen to get COVID-19, um, um, you know, God hoping that you don't, but if you do, it's very important that you rest and recover appropriately fully before going back to work because Amy and I have both heard lots of stories of folks that have gotten sick and they've, you know, mm-hmm. been sick for a week or so and then they think they're over it and then they go back to work and then they get very sick and they crash very rapidly and then they end up in the ER or they're on a ventilator. So mm-hmm. please, you know, uh, take the time to get fully well. I've heard estimates of anywhere from three to four weeks to mm-hmm. fully recover from this. So I'm just, you know, advising people to be, you know, put your health above and beyond everything with this particular bug because it's 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 quite uh, dangerous and pathogenic and people can become, as Amy will speak to, they can become very acute and very sick very quickly once things start to to get really bad for them. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Frederick, can you pull up my first slide for me, That the one from the Australian video there? Sure. Yeah. Give me yeah. one second. I'll pull that up. So here you go. Okay. There you go. Yeah. So um, so this slide is something that one of our members on Twip Pro, Mark Charette, shared from a video from Australian news television. And it really brought a lot of insights to me that I had not really seen before, but this slide demonstrates graphically the importance of social distancing. And what you see here is the number of cases over a period of a time of 50 and 100 days. And if eight of 80% or 90% of people comply, you can see that that curve starts to flatten out. You've been hearing a lot of talk about flattening the curve. That in fact will happen if in these areas where we need to be social distancing and and practicing self-isolation, as we have to here in California, New York, other places like that, uh, if 80 to 90 people of those people 
percent of those people comply, the curve will flatten out. However, if only one less person complies, 70% of people comply. That means, you know, 30% of people or three people out of 10 are not complying. The curve continues to go up. Okay, it continues to escalate. And so then we get into the situation where the the epidemiology, the spread of the disease, you know, gets into this exponential phase and many more people get sick from this. So I just put this slide in to emphasize the um, the importance of social distancing. And one of the things that we're seeing in some of the states, the United States has been taking a middle of the road approach. And, and we're seeing more and more states kind of go into a stay at home policy which I think is very advisable given this data. Um, but also um, some of the states in the Midwest have been taking a middle of the road approach where they're not closing down the state yet and or they're, they're only recommending certain portions of the state close down. So I'll show you the impact of this on the next slide. Frederick, if you can pull up the second slide for me, please. Um, so this is just a quick example where the governor in Kentucky um, uh, issued a state of emergency uh, on the 6th of March uh, for his state. And the governor of Tennessee, which is literally next door, issued a state of emergency only one week later. And you can see in yellow the, the Tennessee number of cases escalate versus the Kentucky. Uh, and so this is a very clear graphical demonstration of the rate of increase from a state that delayed social distancing and self-isolation by only one week. Okay, so even if your state is not given a general guidance yet for social distancing and self-isolation, and you're living in one of those areas, I would highly, highly recommend that you follow the, the best practices of the states that have implemented this policy, yeah. uh, not only for your own health, but for the broader public health of the regions in which you live. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, oh, another point is, is that just for, and Amy can speak to this as well, and I'm sure she will, um, but this is not just the disease of the elderly. There's been some initial reports. Frederick, you can actually um, close those if you like, those that sure. slide if you like. Um, uh, uh, there's been some initial reports that this is primarily disease of seniors. And, and that is true in the sense that seniors have a greater risk for more uh, 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 serious disease and or a risk of dying from this disease. But, <clears throat> pardon me, 58% of patients that are between 18 and 54 uh, are infected with uh, COVID-19. So this disease does make younger people and middle-aged people sick as well. And yeah. they are, in fact, the majority of the folks that are sick. So this is very important to not take lightly that even if you're young and you may have mild symptoms, please be considerate and think about your family mm -hmm. members and friends that may be older, you know, that would, that would be put at risk if you don't take the appropriate safety measures to protect yourself and your loved ones and your friends. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, um, uh, what I would recommend is please check your, your county public health website for local information about what's going on where you live. Uh, Frederick, if you can pull up the Sonoma County link for me. I just found this link yesterday, uh, and this is a county just north of where I live in Northern California. Uh, and they've got a really great dashboard that kind of shows what's going on with the cases. And I'm pretty sure that all counties in all states of the United States have a, a county Department of Public Health. And they may not have something as cool as what Sonoma County has done, but you should still look at that and look at the guidance that they're providing where you live, because they will have some up-to-date information about what's going on where you live, so you can make informed decisions about how you want to engage when you go outside and do your errands and, you know, go go amongst the public. So th I thought this was really nice. Not all states, certainly where I live in Alameda County, we don't have something this nice, uh, but it's nice to see information like this so you can start to understand what's going on where you live. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And then just two other, you know, kind of really quick points. Um, uh, and again, I'm not an MD, so please discuss this with your doctor. But some signs of folks that may have infected is, is some folks, maybe 10 or 20 percent, um, lose their sense of taste or smell if they become infected, which is an unusual symptom. And I've, I've seen some folks that ha have that as their primary symptom and aren't actually particularly sick. So again, if, if something like that happens, please take note of that. And also for folks that are on um, um, uh, certain types of blood pressure medicine um, called uh, ACE2 upregulators, 
Uh, there are certain blood pressure medicines that regulate that and make it go up so your blood pressure goes down. Please consult with your doctor if you're on one of those medications because the virus binds to the ACE2 receptor to get into the lung cells. And so these medications would potentially, I'm not a doctor, so take this with the appropriate guidance and disclaimer, please consult your physician if you need to p potentially go on to another blood pressure medication uh, if you're on an ACE2 upregulator. Um, and you can search for your medication online and it will tell you if it is or not. So you can just put in the name of the drug and it will tell you how it works and if it is. Uh, and then lastly, if your photographer is going on an assignment uh, and you're still doing work, you know, if you're maybe by yourself in a lone space or something, please wear gloves when you go out and just be really careful, you know, with what you touch uh, with your hands and stuff. So, Frederick, mm -hmm. we're right up at, at 6.16. I went 11 minutes. I think we can turn it over to Amy. Perfect. Yeah. And what we'll do is also we will um, one of the segments that we're going to talk about in this whole thing is the idea of. Uh, best practices around wearing gloves and masks and that sort of, uh, what is it called, the Amy PPE, protective equipment? Yeah, so, PPE, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll talk about that as, as, as we get towards and deeper into in sort of the, the dialogue back and forth in this segment. But Amy, go ahead, take it away. Yeah, so uh, uh, just a little background on my hospital. I work at a 523-bed hospital in Portland, Oregon. Um, we are probably the second largest hospital in Oregon and in the Portland service area. Uh, we're also part of a large integrated healthcare system called Providence St. Joseph, which uh, if any of you live on the West Coast, you're probably familiar with uh, either a Providence Hospital or a St. Joseph Hospital. So um, that has actually benefited us because this uh, disease, as Stephen talked about, has progressed so rapidly that we've been able to not only access the large uh, cadre of knowledge uh, within our healthcare system, but also some of the integ integrated uh, structures and systems like our uh, labs and our respiratory therapists. And uh, so we're very well resourced and I, I think we're very fortunate for that. But um, so as we've all kind of experienced on March 2nd, uh, I went into work and I uh, was planning to go about my day and we decided to uh, stand up our command center because we realized the urgency of addressing this disease as quickly as possible. Our governor here in Oregon was very proactive and as Jeff, as Stephen spoke to the fact that we uh, took this issue seriously early on, I think is going to hopefully in the long run benefit us. But um, at the hospital, it has been a crazy month of, uh, of really trying to figure out well, how does this uh, manifest itself and how do we care for all these people? You know, the first I would say a couple of weeks of this journey, uh, we saw a lot of people coming into our emergency departments and I would call them uh, sort of COVID curious, you know, they're sort of, uh, I feel funky, I've got shortness of breath, I'm coughing. And at that time we had uh, very little uh, testing capability. I think in Oregon, we only uh, were able to test a couple of hundred people a day, which was very limiting because we um, couldn't, test very many people. So our threshold for testing was that you had to be admitted to a hospital, which is very challenging when you have a, a huge population of people who might be uh, might be contagious. So uh, for the first couple of weeks, that was our limiting factor. And so we were testing a lot of people and it was taking quite a while to get those tests back. And I think as many of you now know, um, the resources have been very challenging. We've had such a shortness of the protective equipment um, that, let's see, am I echoing here? I'm sorry, I apologize. Maybe I need to turn down my volume. So I'm working on that. You're good, Amy. Okay. Um, so with limited resources, if it takes two to three days to get a test back, if the test is positive, you're, of course, going to care, you know, wear the right protective equipment. If the test is negative, you're going to have two or three days that you're wearing uh, protective equipment that is uh, very, it's a scarce resource. So throughout this month uh, that we've been on this journey, the hardest part of this has been 
protecting our frontline staff and making sure they have the right resources. And um, I don't need to repeat what you're all seeing on the media, which is uh, some of the things that we've been trying to do in healthcare in order to protect our healthcare healthcare folks. And uh, it's been very challenging and it's been the number one issue that we're dealing with at the hospital. Uh, we have lots of organizations who are trying to contribute and help us, uh, you know, deal with this shortness of the masks, the face shields. And Stevie can speak to this more than I can, but sort of the fact that this is an airborne contagious situation, um, you know, when you're working in a hospital, there's a lot of things you do very close to the patient. Uh, one of the things that we never really, really thought about was uh, laboring moms, you know, if for 10 or 12 hours, nurses are in it, really close to laboring moms who are breathing heavily for the right reasons. But uh, for some reason, they're finding out that uh, women at, that are at term uh, are uh, more susceptible to this disease. It's, it's, it's an, an unknown reason why, but they're finding that a lot of uh, at-term moms are contracting COVID, probably maybe because of the vulnerability of their bodies at this time. I don't know. But that's leading to a whole different set of issues that we're having to deal with at the hospital as far as uh, how do we take care of our moms. If they're COVID positive, do we let them be with the baby and then put the baby at risk? So, you know, every day while we're, we're working in the command center, these are the issues that we're dealing with. Um, and obviously, supporting our frontline staff is really the most important thing that we're doing because without them, we can't take care of our patients. So we've been fortunate in Oregon because the progression has been uh, slower than it has been in states like California and New York, where they're really in a crisis mode. So I have spent most of my days uh, working on what we call surge planning. So that's uh, sort of waiting for that big surge of patients and looking where we can put patients in the hospital and uh, the multitude of things that we have to do to get ready. Everything from getting your electronic medical records in line to having the right supplies, the right PPE, the right uh, equipment, because of course we know that we're going to need a lot of ventilators. That's a big part of this uh, disease. Um, and having the right personnel in the room and being able to uh, bring staff to all these different parts of the hospital. So it's not just about having the physical capability to take these patients as having uh, the right people, the right uh, equipment, the right structures in place to support all that. Um, and we have a little lead time because like I said, in Oregon, we've had a slower progression than they had. Uh, a lot of our sister hospitals in Seattle and Washington have not had that grace uh, time and they've really had to emergently deal with this. So, uh, we're learning a lot from Seattle, and that's been a, a really nice thing. So, um, but what I'm most concerned about is um, this is a marathon, right? Uh, I think Stephen can speak to this more than I can, but we don't know how this disease is going to manifest itself. Uh, we're doing a lot of research. We've got some clinical trials going, but um, we're not we're not curing this disease when we treat patients in the hospital. We are just trying to keep them alive until they get better. So we're not, you know, it's not like a cardiac situation or other, um, you know, medical manifestations where you say, come into the hospital, we're going to treat you with this antibiotic. We can't do that. We, cause we don't know yet what's going to, what's going to make people feel better. All we can do is just keep them alive until the disease runs its course. And the challenge with that is that we have people staying in the hospital for you know, 15 to 22 days, which is a long time to take care of people. And if you start to incrementally increase the number of COVID positive patients you're taking care of, your resources start to run out. And so that's really the challenge is how do we wisely use our resources, take care of our caregivers uh, and try to get through what we all know is that sort of the flatten the curve, right? You know, it's like extend this so that we can use our resources in the best way possible. So it's, um, it's a really interesting challenge. I'm, uh, I, since March 2nd, I've worked, uh, I think I've had three days off. I go to work at about six in the morning and I come home at about 6.30 at night. 
Uh, I'm on phone calls with our, our system office, which is part of the whole Providence St. Joseph system. And we're all trying to collaborate and learn from each other and help each other and, you know, put the resources in the right places. Um, and then we're also dealing with issues just right on the ground at St. Vincent, which every day it's just different. You know, it's, it's like juggling cats. And I have a cat right here, and I can tell you how fun and hard that is. But, um, but it's also been, uh, I think anytime you have a crisis like this, you see the best in people. You also see the worst in people. And I think we've all seen examples on media of people who are not taking this seriously. But I also, I get, you know, 20 phone calls a day of people wanting to help, you know, people in the community. We have uh, Nike, the, the, uh, the, famous sportswear company is in our backyard and we're collaborating with them to make face shields for our caregivers in the emergency room. You know, those kinds of things just really uh, make you feel like there's some hope in the long run for all of this and that we're all going to come out on the other side uh, in a better place. So with that, I, I don't know if my 10 minutes is up, but I'll, I'll sort of settle it there, but no, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. That was perfect. So so what I want to do and, and just FYI, a little a little bit of housekeeping. Some people are saying that there's a little bit of echo in the webinar. So I'm going to mute whoever's not talking, uh, you know, and I'll try to stay on top of that. So um, what I want to do now in the interest of time we're we're doing, we're perfect. We're right on time is at the top of the the top of the the outline that I put together that I shared with you guys is let's just set the stage. You both did a, a perfect a perfect sort of um, discussion on the spread of the disease from Stephen's standpoint and, and the importance of social distancing and that sort of thing. And then Amy, feet on the street, you know, you're on the front lines preparing for, you know, the worst and hoping for the best. Uh, but let's roll back a little bit and, and talk about where this virus came from, you know, without going into conspiracy theories that we've all seen in the news and on Facebook and all that. But I want to I want to talk about the science of where it's from. I was surprised to know Steve from Stephen. You told me that uh, this is another SARS type virus. Right. And the coronavirus is a family of viruses or viri. Uh, and this is just yet another one in that that family. Can you go, Stephen? Can you go into detail a little bit more on just the science of this this monster that we're battling? Uh, I could, but I would lose you guys really quickly because I just read all the sequencing analysis last night um, in a paper, and I don't want to get into clay, you know, cladistic analysis and things like that. Uh, but what I will say is that this virus is somewhat unique. Um, it has some uh, aspects that are similar to SARS, uh, but it's also got some genetic elements um, that that translate themselves literally into elements of the virus physically that make it much more infectious. Um, th there's little uh, protein spikes on the surface of the virus that bind to a receptor on your cells that is called ACE2. Uh, and this is the same receptor that mediates blood pressure. Um, and those spike, they're actually called spike proteins by the folks that study these viruses. And, and in particular, the SARS-CoV-2 has a new element in the spike protein that makes it more pathogenic. That is the, the severity of the disease that is caused by the virus is, is, um, is, is, you know, this is why we're seeing the, the number of folks dying from this worldwide, uh, is it's, it's, path it's quite pathogenic, and this is why it's so dangerous, and this is why all the health professionals are so alarmed by it. It's, it's, it's got the, the original SARS virus doesn't have this, this particular protein sequence in the spike protein that makes it even more dangerous than the original SARS. Um, and so this is why I was stressing, you know, please take this seriously. Um, you know, there's a lot of back and forth about where the virus originated. Certainly the epidemic started in the Wuhan center of China, you know, and there's been a lot of back and forth about who the first patient was and all of that. I don't think that that really matters per se, other than it's here and we have to deal with it effectively. Um, but I, I think it's, it speaks to the, the, quick, the, the fact about how quickly um, it, it is in, to get on top of these things. Um, uh, when they break out. And I don't, again, I don't want to get into politics, but I will say that um, because China waited 30 days before announcing this outbreak to the WHO, 
probably did not help matters um, in terms of um, the number of folks that got sick. And so this is why the things that Amy has been talking about and that I've been talking about, about doing the social distancing to kind of mitigate the spread as much as possible is so important. Okay, so so here here's I want to I want to jump in and then sort of cut to what a lot of people are thinking or what I just started thinking a couple of days ago. And that's the idea is, is, is it a foregone conclusion that everyone is going to get this virus and the social distancing and flattening of the curve is just to prolong that so that there can be a cure or some sort of vaccination created so that when you do get sick, you can be cured from it. Is that, is that fair, Steve? Um, no, it's not actually really accurate. So there's a link in the show notes that Frederick will have uh, by Dr. John Campbell, who's an MD in, um, in, in the UK. And I also wanna talk about um, uh, Reg Baker's comments in just a minute. Uh, and, and Mark's, but um, the bottom line is, is the, the virus has to infect a human being to make that human being sick and it cannot replicate without infecting a human being. If people that are infected are not in contact with people that are not infected, the virus will not spread, okay? And it will ultimately die out because if the people that survive the infection uh, become immune, then the people that have been infected are immune and the virus won't spread anymore because of the social distancing. So it's not a foregone conclusion that everyone will get it. The most important thing is, is to prevent people that are infected from coming in contact with others. And if they don't, the people that are not infected will not get sick. You have to come in contact with someone that is shedding virus or have some sort of physical contact of picking up a virus particle from a surface where someone has sneezed or touched their face or a mouth and then touched the surface like a door or a tabletop or something like that. And then you touch that surface and pick it up. So this is also the importance of not touching your face in particular, your, you know, your face, nose, and also your eyes. A lot of people get sick with influenza and colds and RSV by touching their eye and the virus will enter the, the mucosa in the eyelid as well. So, um, so it's not a foregone conclusion everyone will get sick. Uh, if we social distance appropriately and with enough, you know, uh, resolve, um, we can get a handle on this. Um, can I speak really quickly to um, these questions, Mark or, or uh, Frederick, or do you want me to postpone them until Let's later? Let's postpone those to the end. Okay. We've got All a lot right. to get through. Um, okay. So keeping on that, that topic, you know, you hit on this a little bit in the beginning, Stephen. The, yeah. who, who is most susceptible to, to the virus? There's been rumors that uh, you know, infants and kids, you know, are, are, so, are not susceptible and only it, old people. And no, you know, so everybody, that rumor. everybody is susceptible. What, what the difference is, is how sick they get when they become infected. Okay. But any human being is susceptible to the virus. The virus will bind to any human ACE2 receptor on a, on a, a, a class two nemesis or, um, um, lung cell. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and can get sick. The difference is, is the morbidity or how sick people get. There is a relationship between that and age. But here's the key point. Even if you're young and you survive, this damage does extensive damage to your lungs and your lung function will be compromised even if you recover. So this is why I keep stressing, you got to take this really seriously. This is no freaking joke. Okay, that's the politest language I can use to describe it. But um, anybody can be infected, anybody can get sick. Younger folks don't have the degree on average of being as sick as others. But I just heard a report today of a 25 year old athlete, you know, star athlete dying from it. He was 25 years old. So there's, there's some of the stuff you've been hearing in the media that only older people die from it. While that is statistically true on average, that that is the predominant demographic that gets sick, it is not an absolute. Good. Good. Okay. Perfect. I just wanted you to put a pin in that for us. Yeah. Let, let, Amy, I want to bring you back in and talk a little bit about treatment. And we talked about this a little bit last night in our in our rehearsal. But w one of the things that's that's hitting me is like every morning I'm like, okay, am I breathing okay? Do I have a fever? You know, I'm paranoid. Like, well, how do I know if I'm getting sick? In particular, COVID nineteen. And, you know, and if I do 
if I am legitimately feeling like I should call the hospital or go in, I don't want to go in and put undue stress on you people, you know, that are that are there trying to figure this out. How do how do I kind of sort through that? Yeah, that's really a challenge. And um, I, I think that's one of the mysteries that's uh, hard for our ER docs, especially is understanding, uh, you know, what is that nuance, right? When you've crossed the line, because if you test, if you're not symptomatic, you maybe have one or two things that are kind of not feeling quite right. You may come back negative and that's going to give you a false sense of security that, oh, that's great. And, and I think a lot of people on this webinar might say, well, that's it. I want to go out and get tested. But that's not really going to tell you anything uh, because it could progress later and be look a little different. I guess and I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. But what I'm hearing is, you know, your body, right? You know, your own self better than anyone. Um, if you're starting to feel something's weirds going on, you don't feel quite right, or you're having that sort of shortness of breath, or uh, one of the things that one of the ER docs told me is hold your breath for 10 seconds. If that's more difficult than you're used to, then maybe you should start monitoring a little more closely. Call your private, your primary care physician. You know, Stephen brought it up. I think our county health and our state health associations are amazing. They have so many resources. This is what they've been made to do. Uh, they are collecting information collectively from all of us, right? Uh, hospitals rarely share information with each other because, you know, we're in the business to stay alive. But that's what the state health associations and the counties are there for. They all have resource lines. You can call them and uh, just talk to them and say, this is how I'm feeling. There's a lot of resource uh, nurse resource lines. Uh, so stay on top of it. Take it seriously because... One of the things we're finding is people are sort of, yeah, not wanting to tax our resources and then they come in and they're crashing. Uh, and that's a really dangerous place to be in. And we've had a couple of folks come in. We had one day where we had to intubate, which is where you have to kind of help people breathe. Um, we had to intubate four people uh, it, within an hour. And that's that's scary. That's a scary place to be in. It's scary for the hospital because it's it, that, you know, every second is of the essence. So. Like Stephen said, you got to take this seriously. Age, uh, they really are mystified because it, there's no unique um, population that is the victim of this. It's everybody. And they don't, you know, they can send home an 80 year old who's doing fine after COVID, and they're still got a 20 year old on a respirator so, or a vent. So, you know, it's just, I think, knowing your body, knowing and staying attentive to that. Keeping the social distance thing is absolutely key. I, you know, we can't emphasize it enough. It, this is a short term uh, inconvenience for us to, to stay healthy and alive. So we may uh, I'm an introvert, so I'm like, this is great. You know, I don't have to hang out with people. But for the rest of those who are really wanting to be with uh, friends and family and go out and drink and go to restaurants and all that, um, you know, this is a time to sacrifice all that and just take care of yourselves and your family, yeah, Amy, really, and, not, Amy, and not infect others. You're an introvert, which is one step away from where I am, which is a misanthrope. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so a lot, a lot of people say that, uh, and I hate using that phrase. I've been hearing that uh, people are worried that if you get the virus, it's a death sentence, right? Mm -hmm. You, yeah. you know, you're gonna, you get this thing, it's game over. Start doing your last will and testament. And, <laughs> and all that can you can one of you guys talk to this you know talk to the the fact that this is what it is just a really 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 bad flu right so yeah, yeah. talk talk to what it like me amy maybe you can do this since you're on the front trenches like what does it look like when you get it you're like okay yes mr johnson you are covid19 positive mm -hmm. what are the next you know knock on wood what yeah. what do the next you know, month and a half or two months of my life look like after I hear that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I can't say collectively, collectively, Frederick, what it, the, what that looks like. Um, I mean, we have a lot of patients who we, uh, we admit to the hospital, they go to a, a med surge unit and they get regular care and then we discharge them home because uh, the uh, lack of, of protective equipment means that we just can't keep people in the hospital longer than they should be. So we've got to get them home and isolated as quickly as possible if that's clinically okay. Um, 
there's a small percentage that are going into the critical care areas, those folks are staying a long time. So I really can't say that every person is, the disease is gonna manifest the same or that there is a common thread. It really does impact people differently. And I and I'll, I defer to Stephen who knows the science of this, but I have been mystified. I mean, I've seen, uh, we've got uh, a 46 year old who's been there. She's been with us for three weeks. She's not out of critical care yet. Um, so, you know, it's just been patient to patient and uh, we're doing the best we can. And we're lucky because we don't have the surge yet. So we're able to take care of every patient that should be there. Uh, later, we're gonna start having some of those ethical discernments where we talk about how do we care for the really critically ill when we don't have the same resources? And that's gonna be a challenge, so. But Stephen, I think you know more about the science of it than I do, so. Yeah, you know, Amy, I think you touched on the point. It's very, it's, it, you know, everybody has a different genetic constitution. People have slightly different, you know, immunological uh, profiles and constitutions depending on their age and how healthy they are. Uh, and so it's, it, there's no hard and fast prediction. If you look at the overall global statistics, right? And, and again, the, the, how you're going to do is both is highly age and demographic dependent where you live, you know, the quality of the health care system in the country you live in, the population demographics, for example, a lot of the folks that, that, you know, that died in Italy were elderly folks that had a history of smoking and things like this, right? That was just the demographics of that part of, of, of um, uh, Lombardy in Italy. Um, you know, other countries like Germany has a, a, a lower percentage of folks that are dying than the United States uh, by percentage. And, and, you know, they've got excellent health care in Germany uh, and they're staying on top of it. So uh, it's really hard to predict in any absolute. It's, it's you know, on average, 80 to 85 percent, uh, I would say on average, 85 percent are folks that get this do recover. But again, that's going to really be dependent on um, the age of the person and if they have what doctors call comorbidities, which is other things in their life, like if they've got heart disease or, you know, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, suppressed or compromised immune system, things like that. And if you're older and you have those things going on, there is a higher risk. But again, everybody's, you know, I think, Amy, you, you told the story of someone that was 80 years old that walked out of the hospital the other day and someone that was in their 50s that was really struggling or something like that. So there's no absolutes. Um, it, I think the key thing is do everything you can not to get sick uh, and, you know, stay at home washing your hands. Um, I'll just touch on this really quickly. I wear gloves when I go to the supermarket. All the food I bring back, I disinfect either with, you know, isopropyl alcohol or bleach wipes for, you know, hard packaged goods like plastics and cans and things like that. Anything that's frozen foods, I, I you know, have gloves on. I take them out of the box. I put just the things in the freezer, right? Um, uh, I wash all fruit and veg in the sink with soap and water, rinse it really well. Um, you know, so I'm just, I'm doing, you know, the Mark Watney sciencing the shit out of this kind of approach. Uh, if you remember the Martian, um, yeah. and you know, I think, I think folks would be well advised to do that as well. Um, yeah. And Stephen, I'm, I'm curious and on that tangent and we're, look at this, the hour is almost over. So we got, we're almost into the Q and A. So I want to yeah. dive into a couple things on prevention. Yeah. So, uh, best practices for masks and gloves. Um, I've heard spe specifically on masks, I've heard, uh, first they were saying, don't, don't buy masks, you know, cause we don't want to take them away from the Amy Brooks of the world, obviously. Um, but then they were also along with that saying that they don't really work anyway. They just keep the virus from leaving Not you true. and they protect others. And then yesterday, the CDC, there was a, there was a notice that was saying that they may be considering issuing a <laughs> countrywide edict that everyone wear masks when outdoors. So, so what does that mean? It means that CDC is not providing leadership in the appropriate guidance, okay? The simple facts are masks work. Uh, and there's a link to a, a YouTube video by Dr. Kim from South Korea. There's a culture in Asia, China, Japan, and Korea where people that are sick wear masks in public to protect the public health because they're already sick. There's a reason why surgeons wear masks in the operating room right? Masks work. It's as simple as that. I think that the guidance that the Surgeon General has been giving has been misguided. If you want my honest opinion, they work. You should wear them if you have them. Um, 
uh, I don't think you need to wear goggles, Diane, because, Diane, because um, goggles are for folks like Amy's colleagues that are in the, the medical units that are treating patients that are sneezing and coughing to protect their eyes. You know, and then just practice good common sense of social distancing when you're in the supermarket. Stand six feet behind somebody, wear a mask, you know, uh, wear gloves. I wear gloves when I go to the supermarket. Uh, I take the gloves off when I come into the house. Uh, if you have enough gloves, double glove so that if a glove becomes contaminated, you can peel one off and still have a glove to protect yourself. There's a way to take a glove off if it's contaminated without contaminating yourself. You, you take your finger and you flip it under the edge and you peel the glove off like this. It just peels off and it reverses itself inside out. And then you can safely throw it away without contaminating your hands. Okay, so I always wear gloves when I go to the supermarket. And then I disinfect my food with my gloves on, my second pair of gloves on. And then I take my gloves off, like I just mentioned, and I go wash my hands thoroughly after that. And I wash my hands for 30 seconds, not 20 seconds, because if you wash for 30 seconds, you get 99.9% .9 of any pathogens off your hands, where the 20 seconds, it's only about 95 to 98%. So it just takes one virus particle to make you sick. Okay. And that's with um, hot water and soap, right? Now just yes. It, it's really the soap and water. The soap acts as a surfactant for the water to rinse the particles off your hands. And again, you should be doing clinical washing like a, the way a surgeon does and there's youtube videos how to do clinical hand washing that people can look up and i recommend that Let, let's nope. talk about some but before we move on to the future because i want to i want to get to that before we close off uh this segment and move into the q a but the sort of day-to-day -day operation of living in a world that is shelter in place right so what is what exactly does that mean i know it means that you can still go on walks and go outside as long as like you said steven six feet away from other humans but does that mean no takeout does that mean i can't i'm in california does that mean i can't go to in and out burger and go through the drive through anymore you know what what is it what does it mean it does it mean just stay at home cook your own food and only go out you know and disinfect everything that you bring in from amazon like give, so, give us that that level of day-to-day -day operation you know, I think that what folks should do is they should go do some intelligence gathering before if they want to buy takeout, like go, go to your McDonald's or your, you know, whatever fast food place, if you're going to do that and watch what the operators that are preparing the food doing, you know, go into the store if they're open and watch what they're doing. Are they wearing gloves? Are they touching the food with their hands? Uh, you know, things like that. Gather some intelligence first. If, if they're protecting themselves, you know, uh, then you can assume if they're handing you your food out the window with gloves on, that the outer packaging should be safe. But again, you know, be careful taking that outer packaging off if you're going to have your hamburger or whatever. You know, the hamburger should be okay if they're practicing the appropriate hygiene in, you know, the fast food place. But again, you know, just gather some intelligence first. Use your common sense. Watch what people are doing. Are people crowded together? Are they wearing masks? Are they wearing gloves? Are they washing their hands? You know, um, what's the person handing you the food doing? Um, Perfect. Perfect. Amy, I want to I want to switch over to you and 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 talk a little bit about, you know, in the trenches. We talked about this a little bit last night in terms of battlefield triage care when things start, you know, hopefully they won't. But if they get really, really bad, medical personnel are going to need to make some battlefield decisions on who gets to live and who doesn't. We, talk talk to us about that. How do how does what goes through your mind there when you have to make that decision, whether it's this teenage kid or this elderly person, right? I think it's always a challenge in healthcare. There's um, a lot of ethical decisions we make every day about uh, how to treat people, and uh, but you know we're lucky. I belong to a Catholic healthcare organization. We're mission-based. And so we do have ethical medical ethicists on our staff uh, who help us with these tough medical decisions. And boy, we could spend a whole hour just talking about the situations that we deal with in the hospital way before COVID. But with the limited resources, you really are going to have to look at those decisions that you're making on the front lines. And I think even in New York, sadly, they're starting to do that, which is really uh, the justice, uh, the common good, um, you know, the compassion that we have to take into account when we make decisions about who's going to get these resources. And I, I hope it doesn't come to that here in the United States and not certainly in our, at our hospital, but we're, we're prepared for it. Um, you know, it's just a reality of working in medical, uh, you know, in, in the healthcare industry that we have to consider that 
if we ever face a pandemic like this. And um, it's, it's heart, it's heartbreaking. And, you know, that's not why any of us go into healthcare. We're, we're here to save lives. We're not here to make those decisions. So we need help with that. Uh, thankfully at Providence, we do have that help. Uh, but there's a lot of collective energy around that. Even uh, the state has put together some good documentation on how do we uh, deal with the sort of the ethics of a situation like this. And uh, it's really historic. Uh, um, and we're really in a really pretty historic time right now dealing with this. Uh, but like I said, if we can flatten the curve and uh, not have to face those kinds of uh, decisions, that would be really uh, what we all hope for, I think. Um, but it's challenging. You know, I see that the wear and tear of this uh, pandemic on our caregivers, you know, they're scared. They're scared for themselves. They're scared for their families. I mean, we, you know, if you're working all day in a critical care unit taking care of COVID positive patients, and you have young kids at home, you know, that's a decision those caregivers are making every day to go home and potentially infect their families. And uh, if they have elderly parents or anyone or in their neighborhoods, that's really challenging. And, and I worry about the mental health toll this is taking on our country and on our healthcare workers. Of, you know, we can physically get through this because there's a lot of adrenaline right now, but the mental health toll is is something that really makes me pause uh, and i think it's it's affecting all of us um we do have some new uh telehealth mental health uh resources for our caregivers but we're kind of in the thick of it now so i don't know if anybody's taken that time to go you know what i need to spend you know 30 minutes kind of you know venting and sort of releasing this and before i go home and spend time with my family so uh, at Providence, we're looking into alternative housing for our caregivers. If they don't want to go home, they can go and get, uh, you know, apartments and hotel rooms are around our region. Uh, and the people that are reaching out to help us with that are really amazing. And I, that's the kind of, you know, when I was talking about the best in everybody and the worst, you know, like people coming together to want to help us is really amazing. And that's uh, very touching. It really does. Um, it gets emotional at times to think about all of that and the impact on people. So, yeah, you know, I mean, and, and part of part of this is is also, and I know I'm, I'm skipping over large swaths of our outline because we're running out of time. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, the the future of, mm -hmm. of what does a post COVID nineteen world look like? And yeah. and you know, Stephen, I'd love for you to jump in here too. Like, what what is there such a thing as a post COVID nineteen world, or is it a oh. is it a next coronavirus world and we're going to be practicing social distancing as a way of life going forward which impacts you know large sporting events going to the movies you know disneyland etc cetera, etc cetera. are we looking at that future or is this going to be a distant memory in in the future it depends frederick i don't know that we know the answer to that yet it really will depend on the epidemiology of this virus um it will also depend on the mutation rate and how we deal with it from a public health perspective you know public health you know is supposed to be proactive as amy knows right we're supposed to take the appropriate precautions i mean this is why your doctor is always on your case about getting your flu shot every october because they know that the best you know way to prevent getting sick is to get vaccinated you know Hopefully, we will have in 18 months or so a vaccine for this particular strain of coronavirus. Um, but again, it really will depend. We don't have the data to make that type of decision. If we find, for example, like with the 1918 H1N1 influenza epidemic, um, you know, it, it started out in March of 1918. And then uh, it came back really forcefully in November 1918, right as, as World War I was ending w much harder. And it killed 100 million people around the world, which is a huge number. Uh, and then it came back again in 1919. Uh, and then from then on, it's kind of died out. I think we got enough acquired herd immunity that it didn't come back. Um, but I don't, I think it's too early to know. Uh, you know, we, what we have to do is kind of follow the news closely, for example, we may see, I mean, Tony Fauci kind of alluded to this the other day, we may see this kind of die down in the spring, summer time when there's more sunlight in North America and there's greater UV and that will kind of kill virus outside that's on surfaces and stuff, right, uh, over time. Uh, and then we may see another recurrence in the fall. 
I think it's too early to tell. I, I think we just have to kind of track how it goes over time and use due diligence and, you know, take what we've learned from this particular t point in time to manage our health appropriately. You know, my expectation is maybe like with SARS, this will go away and never come back, but I don't know. We don't have enough data to know that. We just have to kind of wait and see and hope for the best that, you know, this will be a one-time thing, but, but we have to be guarded. The most important thing is we prepare appropriately for future pandemics, right? And this was not, help. I don't want to get political again, but it was not helpful to fire the pandemic response team in the National Security Council in 2018 in preparation for this. That was not a smart thing to do. Um, and, you know, Bill Gates is on a, a YouTube video in 2015 saying we need to prepare for the next pandemic after what we learned from Ebola. So I'm hoping that the world will learn from this that public health is a key leadership goal and set of objectives that we have to practice all the time. Yeah, it's like, uh, why do why do we start preparing for an asteroid strike when we can see it coming <laughs> coming at us, right? So you know, let's let's wrap this up with uh, with taking questions from the the chat room. There's a bunch of questions that have been flowing in there, and lots of good statements and support. Thank you, everyone. Um, one is from a good friend of mine, Mark Fuccio, and Mark says, "What is the mutation rate of SARS COVID or COV dash two? Is uh, is that rate?" Is that rate such that SARS-CoV-2 will become epidemic and seasonal like flu? You understand that, Stephen? That's yes, a, I do. Stephen. And, you know, Mark, I'll have to go back and read the sequencing paper that I read last night. But um, but I don't know the answer. I, I think that the, the, the data is not in. And, you know, I, I wrote to Mark and said I'm not going to make a, a, an estimation or in the absence of data, you know, um, it is known that, you know, the, the beta coronaviruses from bats um, do mutate and RNA viruses, which is what coronaviruses are, tend to recombine genetically on their own. Um, but it's impossible to predict. Um, we don't know. I mean, SARS, the original SARS never came back after 2003. Uh, that does not mean that we won't see other outbreaks of these types of viruses in the future. Um, sorry. And... Um, and, uh, you know, we just have to be forewarned and forearmed. Right. And then well, another question is from Keith Yates. Um, and Amy, maybe you can take this one. Keith wants to know, how many times can you wear the same mask? Uh, until it loses its integrity, because we have had to implement what we call a continuous use masking because we don't have enough masks. So we've asked our caregivers to wear their mask until they believe the integrity of the mask is uh, no longer valid. Uh, we also have been working with Medline, which is our primary um, product uh, provider, uh, and they're repurposing masks. So masks that were used maybe in a, in a highly infectious place and need to be uh, cleaned, they take those back and uh, uh, make sure that we can use them again. So that's a great, uh, a great partnership that we have with Medline. So uh, I think wear it until you feel like this thing has kind of lost its uh, lost its life, and then you can switch that out. And I appreciate that people are asking those questions because it does help us, uh, you know, for the common good to to use these resources wisely. So I appreciate that question. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. So I, I would just, you know, somebody I saw that question uh, come in and I answered. I would say that, you know, use common sense. If somebody's next to you and they cough or sneeze next to you and you're wearing a mask, you should discard that mask when you get home and, and use a new one. Um, I, I'm not recycling masks when I go to the supermarket because I don't go to a checker, right? I don't get in contact with anybody. I'm just trying to protect myself, so I'll reuse that mask. But, you know, we don't at home have recycling, the sorts of recycling and disinfecting um, uh, uh, protocols and procedures that Amy has at the hospital. So if, you, if you're using a personal mask, you kind of have to use your best judgment. And if you come in contact with someone that you, you know, I was just at the supermarket a couple of days ago, saw a woman walking with her son and she had a terrible, nasty sounding cough. And she was going into the supermarket with no gloves and no mask on. I was like, man, I'm, I'm glad I'm leaving the parking lot now because she did not sound good. So, you know, if I were around here with a mask on, I would take it off and destroy it, you know, when I got home. So, yeah. Uh, here's another question from Richard Catris. Richard says, is there a difference in effectiveness between using soap or detergent? I know that their actions are supposedly different. What do you guys no. think? Okay. It doesn't so matter. Detergent or soap, it's fine. They, they are both surfactants. What they do is they, they basically 
have a little chemical reaction where they lift the, the particle or the dirt or soil or whatever it is off the surface so it can be washed away by water. So the actual thing that does the cleaning is the water and the soap or the detergent basically acts as surfactant to lift the part, the virus particle or whatever it is off the surface, that's why it's called a surfactant, and make it soluble in water. But it's actually the water that does the cleaning. The surfactant just mediates the process. Okay, great. Uh, Yeni Terimaki says, this is really so informative. Will this be available for download and review later? Absolutely. We're recording and you'll get an email uh, with a replay link right after this thing finishes processing. Uh, Dennis Dunbar says, should you change clothes or should, should you change gloves each time you enter or leave a place such as a market? What do you guys yes, think? Yes, I do. Okay. I only use a set of gloves once. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I'm again, I don't assume that the outside world is virus free. So that's the purpose of gloving. I'm particularly concerned about shopping carts, uh, for example. So, you know, I put my gloves on when I get in the car uh, and then when I get you know, when I get home, actually, I, I take the glove off when I get back in the car. Uh, I open the door without touching, you know, with kind of my little finger, right? Uh, and then I peel the glove off. And then I go and I put on new gloves when I wash my food. Um, so I'm just being super careful about it. Um, but, yeah, I don't reuse a glove for a second trip outside. And Ju so, yeah, Judy wants to know, can, can gloves be washed and reused? So you're saying, no, you can't reuse them? You, you could. I imagine that you could. Um, it's just easier, you know. Uh, I don't know how well the viruses can stick to plastic reasonably well because of their structure. I don't know how well it would come off. I don't want to take the risk. So I'm using gloves once. Sarah France, a uh, wedding photographer. Hey, Sarah. Sarah says, how do you disinfect your food? I'm guessing cooking it, right? Any any other ways to disinfect food? Yeah, well, cooking it will disinfect it. Um, uh, you know, for fruit and veg, you know, lettuce and fruits and stuff like that, plain soap and water works really well. And, you know, um, you can just rinse it off and then the soap is gone. You don't need to worry about having soap on your food. The water will rinse it off. Um, a lot of the stuff that you used to bring home to clean your fruit and vegetables, there was a little product made for, for a while for cleaning your fruits and veggies. That's a surfactant or detergent as well, right? And then you just rinse it off with water, pardon me, with water. So, um, um, and then, you know, for hard things like juice bottles and, and things like that, canned cat food, I use a little bleach wipe and then I plunge it into the sink and water thoroughly take it out, set it in the other the other part of the sink, let it dry, and then I rinse, dry it with a paper towel. And then for cardboard, like frozen food, prepared meals, right? I basically take it out of the box, the, the you know, with my gloves on, I take it out of the box, right? And wipe down the box with like also propyl alcohol, if you got it, right? Take out the box, put the meal in the freezer, you know, um, once I've got my gloves off so that- yeah, and, you know, and just to reiterate, all this that we're talking about, you know, keeping keeping an optimistic view of the world, this is all temporary, right? So you're not going to be doing this for the rest of your life. It's just, you know, a, a, like Amy, Amy said, a temporary inconvenience to to hopefully prolong your life. Um, I'm going to take a, a few more questions here. One is from uh, Mark uh, Zilberman. And Mark says, after infection and subsequent recovery, does one have immunity? Amy, you want to take that? Oh boy. Yeah. Uh, that's a tough one. I mean, we're, we're anticipating a resurgence of this. So I don't know, Steve and I tossed to you on this one. <laughs> so if the strain does not mutate to a different, a different uh, strain of, of, of coronavirus and you, you resolve and become healthy from this afterwards, you will be immune to this particular strain of SARS-CoV-2. That does not mean that you might be immune to next year's coronavirus. Um, so again, this is again, it's no different than influenza, right? There's reasons why influenza has a very high mutation rate. Uh, H the H like this year's is H three and two. That's the strain going around this year, um, and this is why your doctor every October, the fall, really encourages you to kind of get your influenza shot because it mutates pretty much every year. We don't know if that's going to happen with coronavirus yet. We just don't know. We don't have the data, so I'm not going to make a prediction in the absence of data. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, a couple of more questions, and then we'll we'll wrap this up with closing remarks. Um, there was a question in here, a couple of questions. 
the latest one on this topic was from Donna Squire, uh, or actually it was from someone that Donna was answering, but it was about pets and can pets get the virus and transmit it to, to humans? No. They cannot. Okay. No, no. It, so the virus can go into their body, right? But it can't bind to their ACE2 receptors. This strain of coronavirus cannot. Okay. That does not mean there are not other strains of coronavirus that can make animals sick. Um, uh, but this particular one uh, will not make dogs or cats sick. They, c they can get the virus inside of them, but it won't bind to their ACE2 receptors. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. And that question was from Jackie Johnson, who is a Johnson in my family in Las Vegas. Hey, Jackie. Um, okay, let's, uh, I think that's it. Let's, let's move over to, to um, just the closing thoughts. Amy, I want to, I want to throw it to you first to give sort of closing remarks about, you know, from your perspective of where things are right now, where they're going, optimistic or pessimistic. And what does, what does 2021, 2022 look like from a hospital administrator's perspective? Well, I think, I feel that we're fortunate that uh, some of the states in, in the United States have really taken action on social distancing. That's obviously a huge, uh, I think we're learning a lot from each other. I'm really pleased to see that hospitals are working together. Uh, we're working with our competitors uh, to really figure out how can we uh, solve this together. There's not a competition to, you know, uh, you know, have better business or anything. It's really about taking care of our communities. And again, I would reiterate, use the resources that are available to you and your community. And that's either your county health uh, association or your state health association. They not only have information about the disease itself, but they have a lot of other resources about how you can help. I know there's a tremendous amount of energy from people because, you know, we're at home. And so we're, we're anxious to do something to help this crisis. And uh, a lot of those health associations have resources for you to help, whether it's, you know, taking care of your elderly neighbor who needs groceries or taking care of animals that need pet sitting or whatever. Um, I think, I hope we come through this better as a community, uh, that we realize that we need each other, uh, we need to take care of each other. Uh, there's certainly some of those in our community who are more at risk, and I really applaud all the people that I work with. Um, but I think we should be there for each other. And that's what, um, you know, as cautious as we wanna be about social distancing, there's still a way for us to come together as a community. And I think Frederick, you've done that excellently here with uh, the community you've created and some of the other avenues that uh, we've all come to online to be a part of this together. And so um, there's a lot of negative feelings out there, but I also think there's a positive that's going to come out of all of this. And I think that this is it, right? This online community that we've created. So I thank you, Frederick, for um, for this and for, uh, you know, welcoming me and that part of that community. You're welcome. Yeah, I was always told to do what you can with what you have, right? So yeah, Absolutely. Um, Stephen, you wanna you wanna wrap it up? Give us some your closing remarks. Sure, Frederick. Again, I just like to thank you for organizing this. You know, for the the TWIP uh, community, I think you know, hopefully, it will be a, a, a public service uh, to the broader community. Uh, and again, you know, I'll just echo what Amy said. Um, just you guys, be really careful. Practice scrupulous hygiene. Practice the social distancing. Monitor yourself carefully. Amy gave some really good guidance about that. Um, you know, um, don't take this lightly uh, and be safe. Um, and yes, I think Andrew Cuomo should run for president. So um, I'm very impressed with his leadership. I watch his press conferences every day, and uh, that's a great display of leadership right there. Hey, hey, Amy, I'm going to let you have the last word here. Um, if people want to contribute or help, you know, medical facilities that are you know, like yours that are presumably mm -hmm. going to come under stress in the, in the next couple of months or so, a couple of weeks at, or at the, at the least, what, uh, how can they reach out? How can they help? And what can they do to not add to the, the situation? Right. So um, most hospitals have a foundation that uh, you, if you want to contribute with money, you can do so. Uh, and they're always welcoming of that, uh, not just for research, but also helping frontline caregivers find housing if they need that. Um, I have been touched by the little things that people have done in our community. Uh, I shared a video with Frederick earlier. The county uh, sheriff and the local police department came by and kind of gave a tribute, a siren tribute. Um, but as I've walked into work, 
Uh, people have written messages on the sidewalk. Uh, and that just means a ton. It means you're not alone in this. And that's huge, uh, a huge help to our caregivers. So it's not feeling like they're alone facing this, uh, this uh, situation. Um, I would say just um, anything that you can contribute, whether it's PPE or even food or other things that people want to give to the hospital, call your hospitals and just ask them, what can I do? And there are people like me answering the phone and uh, putting them in touch with the right folks. So we're really grateful for the community support we get here in Oregon and people have been absolutely amazing. And it's really, it's quite uh, emotional when you start thinking about it. And uh, I'm glad our caregivers don't feel alone because it's a, it's a tough grind for sure. So thank you, Frederick. You're welcome. You're welcome. My pleasure. And thanks to both of you guys, Amy and Stephen, for coming on. We had a bunch of stuff to cover. We're only get to I think we got to maybe 25 percent of it, maybe 10 percent. Mm -hmm. So we may have <laughs> depending on popular demand. You guys may be on the hot seat again in the in the next couple of weeks. Or so. uh, but this was fantastic. And, uh, you know, the final housekeeping is that, like I said, this is being recorded. And since you registered for the for the webinar, you will automatically receive a link to watch the replay if you so choose. And um, and if we do this again, you'll get a link to to join that that wrap up or the next version of this webinar. So cool. with that, thank you both. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, everyone have a good, safe evening and stay socially distanced and wash your hands, right? <laughs> wash your hands, wear your mask, take your gloves off, like you even said, take them off, stay away from people, especially coughing people. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be better for all this on, on the other side. I think, like like Amy was saying, you know, the, the bright side of all this is, it, it's funny that it took a global pandemic to be a unifying factor to bring our world closer mm -hmm. together. So, you know, but here we are. Absolutely. All right, everybody, yeah. have a good night. And we'll see you yeah. in the next. Thank you. Yep. Bye bye. Okay. This is Twitter.